parental rights. Today we're going to be taking a look at the 20BRA cartridge. Some of you might have just asked, well, what is a BRA? And then, and then further still, some of you might have asked, well, what's a BR? <laughs> well, the history of the BR cartridge it started with Remington, really. Well, and before that, it was Wildcatters. The 308 Winchester showed up, and after that, people began wildcatting, cutting down the 308 case, and making their own variations in all different types of calibers. And one of those wildcats was a 6 millimeter version of a 1.5 inch tall case. Around about the late 70s, Remington started shipping the 40X rifle in 6 BR Remington. And so the BR stands for bench rest. It was originally designed as a, a bench rest targeted cartridge. And those of you that are familiar with the BR and the BRAs, you know that they've done very, very well there over the years. And so the late 70s, Remington kind of started this in an official form where it wasn't just a wildcat anymore. So the 6BR Remington. And then in later years, as people continued to play around with the cartridge, it was standardized more so and called the 6BR Norma. Now it really doesn't matter that much the specifics of the origin of the case because today there are literally hundreds of variations of the BR case. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Creedmoor line of cartridges. Many of you have probably shot one or at least held a case or saw a picture of it next to a different cartridge that you are familiar with. So to give you some idea of the size, so on the right you see the Creedmoor case and on the left you see the 6mm BR case. So there's the 6BR. So what then is the 6BRA? Well, the A in the BRA signifies Ackley Improved. Now, when I say Ackley, I mean P.O. Ackley, Parker Ackley. He is what is considered by many to be the patriarch of the improved 40 degree shoulder variation of many cartridges. So added here next to the BR is the BRA, and you can clearly see the difference in shoulder angle. It goes well outside the scope of this video to talk about just how many cartridges have been born out of the BR case because it is almost unlimited. Every diameter that you can possibly dream up all the way up to 30 or 338, so the focus of our video today is going to be on the 20 caliber variant of the BRA specifically, and we will make reference from time to time to the other variations. Now I shoot uh, 20 BRA, 22 BRA, and 6 BRA fairly regularly, and that entire cartridge family is just an extraordinarily impressive family of cartridges to use. One of the fantastic benefits of choosing a cartridge family when you choose a, a family of cartridges, Wildcats, if you will, they're all based on the exact same host. And if you're controlling your reamer dimension and then your die manufacturer is able to con control the die dimensions very precisely, and trust me, folks, short action customs dies that we use, they can control that dimension very well. With the BRA family, I can have one stock, one trigger, one action, and I can have barrels in 20, 22, 6 mil, and it will all work with the same action and the same magazine. So this gives you the ability to have a completely different type of performance from one barrel or one variation to the next, and all you have to do is swap your barrel. Now while the same thing is true of our PRC Primal line of cartridges, where you can go from 22 caliber all the way to 7 millimeter, the action size for that family of cartridges is, of course, much different. We need a magnum bolt face to accommodate the 6.5 PRC parent case for that family of cartridges. While I have spent some time with the BR variations, I find that the 40 degree improved version of the BR case, the BRA, is the most optimal configuration. One of the primary drawbacks to trying to run the BR-sized cases 
historically was that we couldn't get them to feed correctly out of a repeating action. So the single shot guys were having a great time with them, but anytime we tried to feed them into a bolt gun from a magazine, it would be a tremendous disaster. Well, when we started shooting the BR-sized cartridges, we had to solve that magazine feeding problem, and we came up with a replacement conversion kit for the Accuracy International 308 magazine that allowed us to just take the in inner spring and follower out of the magazine, drop our replacement kit in there, our spacer and follower and spring, and that allowed 100% reliable feeding of these small BR cases. So these kits work equally well with the BRA as they did with the BR, and frankly we have just a huge number of different cartridges that these kits have allowed people to use in bolt-action repeating rifles, such as the Grendel line of cases, the Valkyrie and PPC, and all these other small, short cartridge cases. So now let's dive in and take a look at some of the specifics and how we get from 6 BRA all the way to 20 BRA. And then we'll also look at some of the performance elements of just exactly what a 20 BRA is capable of. We first start out with Alpha Munitions OCD Brass. Now Alpha Munitions makes some of the best brass in the world and they do have 6BRA available on their website. You can choose from 100 or 500 count packages and it's priced very competitively, especially considering the quality that you get. Using an extremely high quality brass is very important as the brass consistency and quality is often the most significant determining factor on whether or not it will shoot accurately and precisely. I've had my best success in the BR, BRA, and Dasher family of cartridges with a small rifle Magnum primer. And my favorite to use is the CCI 450 small rifle Magnum. What you're looking at here is the 55 grain long range varmint. Now this is a 20 caliber bullet from Berger. And there's a lot of you that might not even know that this thing exists, especially if you haven't been in the discipline that long. Here you can see on Berger's website, we have all of the 20 caliber bullets that they offer pulled up. And there's only two. Now there used to be quite a lot more, but you notice that the 55 grain is not even listed as an option here. That is because the only way to get this bullet at the moment is to purchase it from Graf and Sons. So for those of you that aren't aware, Graf and Sons is one of the largest reloading suppliers in the United States. Graf's orders these bullets specially and carries them exclusively. So the only place you can get them is Graf's. These 55 grain bullets in 20 caliber are simply the most impressive and most versatile 20 caliber bullet that I have ever used in any cartridge and I shoot these in everything from the 20 223 Ackley uh, all the way up to the BRA based cases here and then we have something new that we're going to be announcing in the near future that uh, they will also be the primary bullet of choice in. You may be asking yourself why even bother with a 20 caliber? Why not 22 or just stay with 6 millimeter? Well here's exactly why. If launch velocity is equal, a bullet with a higher BC will be superior to a bullet with a lower BC. Let's take a look at the 20 caliber versus the 22 caliber, both 55 grain bullets from Berger. I was able to find the specs on Berger's website from their discontinued bullets page. I then pulled up the specs for the 22 caliber. Now, this is a flat base bullet but it is a 55 grain bullet and it's the closest bullet to this within the Berger lineup. We're going to focus on the G1BC here and I know that the 20 caliber 55 grain Berger here is more closely represented by the G7 standard projectile but because we're using a flat base bullet in the 22 cal we're just going to compare G1s because the flat base is, of course, much more similar to the G1 standard projectile. With a G1 of .354 compared to the 22 calibers G1 of 
0.254, you can very easily see how the 20 caliber 55 grain has a very distinct advantage over the 22 caliber. This advantage is further emphasized if we take a look at some ballistic charts comparing the two. Now I use the ballistic calculator right on Berger's website to ensure impartial data here. And you'll see that at every distance, the 20 caliber in a 10 mile an hour full value wind is vastly superior to the 22 caliber. Now, while it's obvious that the elevation advantage is welcomed, the real benefit here is performance in the wind. Folks, look at those wind numbers. The 22 caliber is very poor compared to that of the 20 caliber. Now, those of you that are field shooters, you know very well that performance in the wind is what gets you your hits. And while I prefer H4350 for BR, BRA-based cartridges, I'm kind of forcing myself to use Varget for this particular project because I have like a ton of it and I almost never shoot at anything. So um, that's what we're using. Short Action Customs full-length bushing sizing dies with custom ground expanding decapper mandrels. Short Action Customs makes some outstanding dies and having good dies with good surface lubricity and proper dimensions is a very critical element to making these rifles shoot their best. Wilson inline micrometer bullet seeders are also a critical part of this operation. This is how we'll be seeding our bullets using the amp press. Both the bullet seeder and the sizing die will be made available to anyone that purchases a rifle system in this cartridge and both are built to our exacting matched specifications. You can see here that the bushing is a shoulder bump bushing, so the 40 degree shoulder is built into this bushing, and we provide two of them, one in 22 caliber, one in 20 caliber. So obviously when we start with six mil, we need to take it down to 22 caliber, so we've got a 0.245, 245 thousandths bushing to go from 6 mil to 22, and then we have the 223 bushing. For the purposes of this video, it's important to note that I've got two of these. Well, why do I have two of these? I take this die, which is set up for one and a half to two thousandths of shoulder bump with my bushings installed. This die with the 22 caliber bushing in will knock the entire neck down to 22 caliber. Then after it's at 22 caliber, I take part of the neck and size it down to 20 cal just so that I can get this in the chamber. Now there's a, another video where I go in detail about the partial necking or the false shoulder creation process, and that is in our 7PRC Primal video. So I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and check that out. Suffice it to say, if I leave this die set in this position with the 20 caliber in there, I'll always be able to take my normal die, swap the bushing from 20 caliber, like my normal die that I use for firing after firing in 20 caliber. I would take that bushing out and put the 22 caliber bushing in here and then grab new batch of brass, size it down to 22 cal and then set my false shoulder with this other die. When I go back to shooting my normal brass then, my 20 caliber variant, I just put my 20 caliber bushing back in this die and the shoulder bump is already set and I don't need to touch this die or this die. So we've got a piece of factory new brass here, and the first thing we're going to do is take it down to 22 caliber. So we'll grab our 22 caliber bushing here and get that installed. I'm going to lubricate the OD of the case up at the neck area and a little bit on the body. What I'm using here is the Imperial Sizing Wax that I always recommend. There's no need to lubricate the ID of the neck at this particular point if you don't want to because the 20 caliber expander in here, the expanding mandrel 
portion of this is not going to be making contact with the ID. So there we have the case necked down to 22 caliber. Now that we've got down to 22 caliber, we're going to take that die out and we're going to put the forming die in that I had previously set to the correct dimension to give us our false shoulder on this neck. Now for this process, I will take a bore mop and put a bunch of lube on it and I will ID lube the neck of the case because we will be dragging that expander mandrel back through at this particular point. The brass now has a false shoulder at 20 caliber. Next up is priming, and I had previously set this up, so we're just going to go ahead and get a primer in here. We're at exactly four and a half thousandths beneath flush, which is exactly what I was going for. Now that we have our primer in here, we're going to go ahead and throw our start charge, which is 28 grains of Varget. Now here's what it looks like with brass that has gone through my process. And I've annealed it, and I've tumbled it, and I've handled it the way that I would normally handle my loads. But here is what it looks like when I do not anneal and try to just go and put a bullet in for fire forming. Now it's up to you whether you want to do this or not, or I could have gone and annealed it between the last step and I probably could have avoided so much of this neck tension. Now the jackets on the 55 grain burgers are pretty good and they can take quite a lot of force and there is a small indentation where the seating stem hit this thing. Um, folks, that's a tremendous amount of force. You know, we're reading out at like, let's see, 175, 180, 85, so it's about 185 pounds of force that it took to get this thing in here. And that is extreme. To compare it, my normal loads, you know, we're averaging like 40, <laughs> 40 pounds. There's a drastic difference between the amount of force required when you're necking something down and you work hard in it like this versus if you would anneal it and handle it properly. Now, personally, I don't really trust the first firing on my brass anyway, and so I'm just looking to get this formed, and guess what? Even at this crazy seating force, this shoots well enough. I mean, I can very easily get half MOA performance out of this, and that's enough to go play around either on target or in the varmint town. So I'll start annealing this and caring about what happens after this fire forming. After we fire form it, I'll take my forming die back out. We're going to put my normal production die back in, but remember, we've got that 22 caliber bushing in here. So we're going to take that out and put our 20 caliber bushing back in. And now that I've got the 20 caliber instead of 22, I'm going to grab my 20 caliber ID lube mop here. And I actually use, like if I'm doing 20 caliber, I'll pick a 17 caliber bore mop. I don't want them to fit too tight and scrape off all the lube. I just want it to kind of gently go in there and lubricate the ID of this neck. Make sure you install your little primer catcher. Don't need those things going all over the place. And there we go. Now obviously throughout this process, you will be checking your headspace using a headspace comparator or whatever device you want to use to, to measure your headspace, just to make sure that you're not overworking the brass. Got one right here, 124 yards.
they don't get a whole lot closer than that. This right here is what this cartridge is all about for me, folks. Prairie Dog Town. There's one just a little bit further. We'll see if we can Kentucky windage him. Yep. And another. Oh, right over him. Held a little too much wind on that one. He looked further, but <laughs> must not have been. It's been a unseasonably wet summer so far and the mosquitoes are absolutely ravenous i'm just getting absolutely devoured out here right now so i'm gonna probably keep this one short i'm gonna quick shoot up the rest of this ammo here hey i got two in one shot canceled out my miss from earlier To send a special thank you to Taylor at Stratton Custom Rifles in Delta, Colorado. This barrel is an absolute laser beam. We're going to go for a little walk here because I want to see what this 480 yard prairie dog I just shot looks like. Well, that's not the one I shot at 480. That's, uh, that's a different one. <laughs> hey, found him. There he is all the way back there 480 yards even at almost 500 yards that bullet is very explosive the real performance that you can expect with a 20 bra with the 55 grain burger in a 26 inch barrel and roughly 30 grains of varget i'm seeing 3600 foot per second as a very reasonable expectation. Obviously every barrel is different and you'll want to use proper and safe loading practices to establish a good working velocity. Rifles like this that provide the kind of uncompromising shooting experience that I want to have couldn't be possible without the cooperation of my good friends at Primal Finish and Stratton Custom Rifles. Daniel at Primal Finish is who does all of the Cerakote work that you've seen on the rifles in my videos. And Taylor Stratton at Stratton Custom Rifles is who does all of my barrel work, bedding, stock work, and basically he is my chosen gunsmith. Well, folks, you don't just come out here and shoot your 20 caliber for group size or score when the wind is blowing over 10 miles an hour. That's just not something that you do. I mean, if you look at the 100 yard data, if you introduce a, even a 10 mile an hour full value wind, you end up holding for wind over a tenth of a mil, probably closer to two tenths. And then you've got the aerodynamic jump aspect in there that's going to change it as well. So you, you can't just zero your 20 cal any old day. Now, having said that, I want to make sure that I show you guys some performance because this 
rifle that I'm shooting here has a brand new barrel from Preferred Barrels. Now, I typically use benchmark barrels, but we, we wanted to try a preferred barrel on this one. And uh, it's important also that you see that despite the fact that the box for the bullet, this 55 grain burger bullet, has a twist recommendation, minimum twist recommendation of one and seven, you can see here that this barrel has a one and 8.5 twist and most of my benchmark barrels have a nine twist. Despite that fact, both my benchmark barrels, and as I'm going to try to attempt to show you, this preferred barrel, even though it's well above what their minimum twist requirement is, it still shoots these 55s extremely well. Now I have, I've shot them in nine twist barrels all the way out to a thousand yards and beyond, and they still hold together, folks. So I'm not just too sure where that twist recommendation came from. Don't worry if you think you've got a twist that's just a little slower than what's on the box, you're probably still going to have a great time with these bullets. So again, with the wind gusting like this out here, we're going to do what we can do, lay down, and I'm going to shoot some groups on camera here. I'm going to set the spotter up and uh, get it trained on the 100-yard target and see if we can throw down some shots. This video and others like it are specifically made public due to the contribution of those that are joined, that are a member of our channel. So if you know any of those guys, be sure to give them a thank you. And here's a big thank you from me. Thank you very much for your support. And don't forget, those of you that are enrolled at the apprentice level or higher, that tier signs you up for one-on-one -on -one support with me for your various reloading and precision rifle shooting efforts.